It is my pleasure to introduce my colleague, Hoi Fun Poon, an expert in healthcare AI and general manager of Microsoft Health Futures to talk about utilizing generative AI to enable precision healthcare. In addition to advancing the frontier of medical AI, Hoi Fung and Microsoft Research have deeply invested in bridging the gap between research and our clinical partners across the ecosystem. I always leave inspired after hearing Hoi Fung talk, and I'm sure you'll feel the same. Over to you, Hoi Fung. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Hoi Feng Poon. I am a general manager at Microsoft Health Futures. I lead biomedical AI research and incubation uh, for precision health with a particular focus on advancing multimodal gen AI uh, to uh, unlock the population scale real world evidence. So uh, in the ideal world, we want every patient to be able to respond uh, to the treatment they have been prescribed as signified by the blue person here on the graph on the left. In the real world, unfortunately, many patients do not respond to the treatment as signified by the red person here. So this is obviously the fundamental challenge in biomedicine, and cancer is really the poster trial of this uh, problem. For example, immunotherapy is the cutting edge of cancer treatment, and indeed, blockbuster drugs such as Kichuda can work miracle on some of the late stage uh, cancer patients. However, the overall uh, response rate still hover around 20-30%. Now, when the standard of care fail, which is often the uh, case for cancer, clinical trial become the last hope. Here's Martin Tannenbaum, uh, a successful AI researcher and uh, e-commerce uh, e uh, entrepreneur. At the peak of his career, Marty was uh, diagnosed with late-stage melanoma. But fortunately for Marty, he was able to mobilize his network to find a matching uh, trial that cured his cancer. However, most patients are not as lucky or resourceful as Marty. Even in the US, only a small portion of uh, uh, patients were able to find a matching trial, whereas a lot of cancer trials fail simply because they couldn't find enough patients. Developing a new drug is notoriously hard, taking billions of dollars and over a decade. And this will become increasingly unsustainable in the precision health, as we actually have to develop more drugs and each for uh, applicable to smaller subpopulations. When we think about uh, drug development, oftentimes the first thing that comes to mind uh, is early discovery. Now this is indeed super exciting and foundational, but in the grand scheme of things, it's only 10, 20% of the total cost. Most of the astronomical costs in drug development actually stem from later stages of clinical trial and post-market. Interestingly, this also happened to be the most low-hanging area with immediate opportunity for major disruptions. For example, a single phase three cancer trial can cost hundreds of million dollars, and we only got, got back a few uh, thousand uh, data points. And the whole process is so inefficient, but there is a, a lot of uh, potential in uh, actually changing this by harnessing AI to unlock population scale real world evidence. In the past a couple of decades, there has been rapid digitization uh, of uh, uh, patient records, and every day there are literally billions and billions of data points collected in routine clinical care about the patient journey from diagnosis to treatment to outcome. At the beginning of a patient journey, even the best doctor doesn't have a perfect crystal ball on what might happen next. So each journey is essentially a mini trial and each encounter brings forth new information. If we can break, crack the code and unlock the inside underneath, this is essentially a population scale uh, free lunch. So um, for example, uh, here is a de-identified journey of a cancer patient where each bar is a, a clinical node. So you can see there are many, many node types and also each node contains a lot of detailed information about the patient journey. Uh, in, additionally, there is a lot of uh, uh, information rich modality from medical imaging to multi-omics. So each of these modality is trying to tell us something about the patient but each is inherently limited. Only by assimilating all this kind of modality can we uh, recapitulate a holistic kind of patient representation. So from a machine learning point of view, precision health amount to learning a function that input multimodal patient journey and then output key medical events such as a disease progression and counterfactual treatment response. If we can predict them well, we have essentially solved a precision health. 
Now, of course, as you can guess, uh, this is not so easy, right? So patient journey is not just a snapshot, but actually a longitudinal time series. More annoyingly, most of the information that we want to have are actually uh, uh, missing, and even the observable information can be very noisy and also contain lots of biases. But this is exactly why Gen AI can be so promising for precision health. The underpinning of Gen AI is a generative model over all the joint distribution of all those uh, clinical uh, variables. So this enables us to compress all the observable information into a patient embedding, which can then help predict the, miss the missing information. And then predicting the next medical event is essentially a special case. So um, our overarching agenda essentially lies in how can we harness those population scale real world data to portray a high fidelity patient embedding that can serve as a digital twin for the patient. And uh, given the patient embedding, we can then conduct patient like me reasoning at the population scale. For example, after the cancer diagnosis, instead of spending months and tons of resources to seek a second opinion, we can essentially snap a finger to get millions of opinion from the most similar patients. We can interrogate their uh, patient journey, such as the treatment pathway and longitudinal outcome, and this can immediately help improve patient care. We can also compare non-responder versus uh, exceptional responder and start probing mysteries such as why those 80% of patients do not respond to Kishuda. And in this way, we can essentially unlock uh, kind of like all those uh, emerging capability from the population scale river evidence that actually allow us to shatter the glass ceiling of today's uh, healthcare common sense. So this is very, very exciting, but the forward path is uh, incredibly challenging. Uh, even the best frontier model have major competency gap for an ever-growing uh, long list of non-tax modality in the biomedicine. So over the past decade or so, we have uh, blazed a new trail by con essentially conducting curriculum learning over three giant free lunches. The first uh, free lunch stem from unimodal data, such as unannotated images. So here, a general recipe for self-supervision lies in pre-training modality-specific encoder and decoder, and then that can compress the input into an embedding and then decompress it back to reproduce the original input. So for text, uh, we can also uh, simply piggyback on fr uh, existing frontier models that are already very, very good at understanding and reasoning with biomedical text. Now, this general recipe is universally applicable and very powerful, but for biomedicine, there are also a whole slew of kind of like modality-specific challenges that require major research innovations. For example, digital pathology is well known to uh, contain a lot of key information about my tumor microenvironment, such as how immune cells interact with cancer cells, which is crucial for deciphering resistance to uh, immunotherapy. So here, Transformer is the workhorse of the Gen AI, and in theory, is actually perfect for modeling such a complex global patterns. However, pathology uh, slides are actually among the largest in the world, a single whole slide image can be hundreds of thousands of times larger than standard web images, which means that uh, it will require billions of times more computation um, and due to the quadratic growth um, in Transformer. So to address this problem, uh, a promising direction is to incorporate this uh, idea called uh, dilated attention, which originated from speech recognition that also had uh, a, a big problem in modeling long contacts. So for images, transformer essentially work by having uh, pixels passing messages with each other, which is, is why uh, it led to the quadratic growth in compute. So in dilated attention, uh, for smaller blocks um, and in no local neighborhood, we will still keep using the full self-attention with the pairwise uh, message passing. But when we pass messages in larger blocks, we will instead uh, try to essentially elect representative for the local neighborhood and then only pass messages among those representatives. So for larger and larger blocks, we will elect sparser and sparser representative. And in this way, we can perfectly cancel out the quadratic growth. So by adapting dilated attention to digital pathology and in collaboration with Providence uh, Health System and University of Washington, we have created GigaPath, the world's first digital pathology foundation model that can truly scale transformer to the whole slide image. And this paper was uh, published uh, by Nature last year. 
And we are very excited to see that in the few months uh, since its publication, Gigapath has already been downloaded well over half a million times across the globe. We are uh, super psyched to uh, see the community's interest, and we have also made a ton of progress in other modalities such as CT and spatial multi-omics. So the unit model pre-training is a very good first step, but there are even bigger challenges. So uh, for example, a pathology foundation model may learn to map a tumor lesion somewhere in the embedding space, whereas a CT foundation model might map it elsewhere. Each modality is trying to tell us something about the patient, but each is speaking its, its own distinct language. So this is essentially analogous to uh, the translation problem for human languages. And in, in the translation space, right, to deal with the multilingual explosion, machine translation system will usually introduce a resource-rich language such as English as an interlingua to bridge uh, among those uh, low-resource uh, languages. For example, there may not be any parallel data between a language in Africa and a sublanguage in India, but we can translate from the African language to English and then from English to the sublanguage in India. And this is indeed how commercial machine translation systems scale to hundreds of languages in the world. So here we propose to follow the same recipe in dealing with the multi-model complexity in biomedicine by introducing an interlingual modality. And tax is uh, uh, an ideal candidate to serve as uh, this interlingua. We already have very powerful frontier model to, uh, to, for the biomedical tax modality. And moreover, for any non tax modality under the sun, the study of the modality involves natural languages, which means that there are a lot of readily available modality tax pairs, such as a pathology slide and the corresponding pathology report. We can piggyback on the unimodal pre-training in the first stage, but uh, by reusing those uh, encoder and decoder, and then focus on using the modality text pairs to pre-train a lightweight adapter layer. And the adapter layer essentially translates from the modality embedding to the text semantic space. So this enables all the modalities to start to speak in the same languages and also help propagate a lot of the rich prior knowledge that have already been captured uh, in the text semantic space to back to individual modalities to help with their interpretation. So for more detail about this uh, general recipe, you can check out our Lava map paper, which was uh, uh, spotlighted in NeurIPS. So here, I also want to add that the Lava paradigm also represents a trailblazing innovation at MSR by harnessing the text processing capability of Frontier model to synthesize multi-model instruction following data. So this has since become a standard practice, including training multi-model phi and other popular vision language models. Now we can extend this recipe to include a pixel level decoder to, uh, for holistic image analysis. So this enables us to develop a uh, biomap parse, which can conduct object recognition, detection, and segmentation in one fell swoop through a unified uh, natural language interface. So we, you can essentially talk to the image to conduct the analysis. So biomap parse is a single foundation model that can attain state-of-the-art performance across nine modalities and six major object types. It was just published by Nature Methods, and in the same issue, Nature Method also published an external review that called Biomed Paris a groundbreaking Biomed AI foundation model and said that the implication uh, of Biomed Paris are profound. So these are all very, very exciting, but we still have one last uh, giant free lunch that lies in the very patient journey themselves. So recall that GPT essentially learned by predicting next token, next token, next token. Right? And in the same way, uh, our patient embedding can actually learn by predicting the next medical event and next medical event. So in this way, we can essentially turn every single patient journey into a cell supervision uh, training instance. So we have conducted some initial uh, uh, exploration on structural medical events uh, using a public data set. Interestingly, scaling law established for text actually are not very far away from structural medical events, and we are now extending the study to much larger data sets. So ultimately, we can imagine embedding not just for patient, but also for interventions, for clinical trials, et cetera. 
And in this way, we can uh, potentially develop a universal embedding calculus for precision health. As we mentioned earlier, clinical trial is the perfect beachhead. Providence is the third largest health system in the US, and they have been using our research system daily now in their tumor board to screen thousands of patients a year, including this uh, high-profile trial as featured by New York Times. Using a Microsoft AI, Providence researchers were able to find actionable biomarker for a majority of patients, and consequently many patients were prescribed with uh, precision therapy, which substantially in increased uh, overall survival. In ultimately, uh, the dream is to drastically scale high-quality healthcare and drastically reduce the cost, and thereby we can democratize uh, such a high-quality healthcare to uh, essentially really for everyone. So with the clinical trial matching capability, we can also uh, essentially snap a finger and control up virtual case arm and control arm, and then uh, conduct uh, uh, clinical research, uh, hypothesis generation, and test using real-world uh, data. Uh, a lot of those marquee lung cancer trials that can cost hundreds of millions of dollars to run can be simulated uh, using real-world data as we have been shown with our Providence collaborators, uh, including the original Kichuda trial. Now, obviously, with uh, 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 exciting moonshots such as uh, Precision Health, it takes way more than a village. At Microsoft Research, we are super blessed by uh, being able to collaborate in depth uh, with talented research across Microsoft Research itself, as well as uh, with uh, academia, with a lot of the key health uh, stakeholders, such as large health system and life sciences company. Uh, many of the uh, frontier uh, biomedical models uh, we have highlighted uh, in this talk are already publicly available in Azure AI Foundry. Now, obviously, much more remains to be done, but even with what we have uh, today, there is already a lot that we can bring forth a positive disruption to scale uh, uh, drug development and improve uh, patient care. Thank you.